The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 15 It means the death of our free commonwealth. T'will be the end of all we've worked for. The angry voices came clearly through the closed door of the company room. It was impossible not to overhear. Mercy's spinning wheel faltered, and Rachel's hand, lighting a pine knot, trembled so that a spark fell on the table unheeded and left a small black scar. Frequently in the past month, the same grim-faced men had called upon Matthew Wood, but tonight the voices had a frightening quality. They must think it a desperate matter to meet like this on the eve of the Sabbath, said Mercy. Your father never touched his supper, fretted Rachel. Do you suppose it would do to offer them all a bite when they come out? Kit dropped a stitch for the third time. She had little concern for the colony of Connecticut, but she was seething with curiosity over one aspect of tonight's business. Some time ago, William had arrived, offered his usual courteous greetings to the women, and then, instead of taking his place by the fireside, had astonished her by knocking boldly on the company room door. More surprising still, he had been admitted, and there he had stayed, behind that closed door for the past half hour. Pride could not restrain her tongue another moment. What in the world is William doing in there, she burst out. Why would Uncle Matthew let him in? Didn't you know? Judith threw her a condescending glance. Know what? William came over to Father's way of thinking two months ago, even before his house was raised when he had to pay such high taxes on his land. Now, how did Judith know that? Kit stared at her. I never heard him say a word about it. Maybe you just weren't listening. Judith's tone had more than a touch of smugness. Chagrined, Kit jerked at another drop stitch. It was true, sometimes when William and Judith were talking about the house, It was all she could do to keep her mind from wandering. But she knew that she would have remembered anything as important as this. Was William ashamed to admit to her that he had turned against the king? Or did he think she was too stupid to understand? The voices broke out again. This Governor Andros says right out the deeds signed by the engines are no better than scratches of a bear's paw. We are all to beg new grants for land we bought and paid for. Why, the fees alone will leave us paupers. They can come into our meeting house and order us to kneel and whine tunes like their Church of England. My cousin in Boston actually had to put his hand on the holy book. To swear in court, I'll shoot any man tries to make me do that. They could hear Matthew's voice cold and steady, never raised or out of control. Whatever happens, he was saying, we do not want any shooting here in Connecticut. Why not, broke in another voice. Should we hand over our freedom without a murmur like Rhode Island? I say defy him, came a hoarse shout. Nine train bands have ready in Hartford County. Nigh unto a thousand men. Let him look into a row of muskets. He'll change his tune. It would mean senseless bloodshed, Matthew said clearly. For an hour, the voices went on, the angry shouting, gradually giving way to a low, tense words that could not be distinguished. Finally, a silent, tight-mouthed group of men emerged with no interest in the refreshment that Rachel timidly offered. When they had gone, Matthew lowered himself heavily into a chair. It is no use, he said. We must spend the Sabbath in prayer that God will grant us patience. Rachel searched for some words of comfort. I know it is a disappointment, she attempted, but will it truly change our lives so very much? Here in Wethersfield, I mean. We will still all be together in this house, and surely we will not lose our rights as citizens of England. Her husband brusquely waved away her comfort. 
That is all a woman thinks about, he scoffed. Her own house. What use are your so-called rights of England? Nothing but a mockery. Everything we have built here in Connecticut will be wiped out. Our council, our courts will be mere shadows with no real power in them. Oh, we will endure, of course. What else can we do? If only we could somehow hold back the charter itself. This man has no right to take it from us. Not till later, when she and Judith undressed, shivering in the chilly upstairs chamber, did Kit dare to venture a comment. They don't seem to realize, she whispered, how powerful the royal fleet is. Once, when the royalists were trying to hold Bridgeton Barbados, Parliament sent a troop ship and subdued them in no time. Oh, I don't think there'll be any fighting, said Judith confidently. It's just that men like Father don't like to be dictated to. But Dr. Bulkley says the charter was never intended to be as free as they have made it. He thinks the men of Connecticut have taken advantage of the king's generosity. So I suppose John thinks so too, Kit couldn't resist adding. Once Judith would have flared, but her new happiness was hard to shake. Poor John, she laughed. He's so mixed up between Dr. Bulkley and father. Honestly, Kit, I agree with mother. I don't believe it will change our lives much. Men make an awful fuss about such things. I just wish it hadn't happened four days before Thanksgiving. It's going to spoil the holiday to have everyone so gloomy. I'd be curious to see this Governor Andros, said Kit. You remember Dr. Bulkley told us he used to be a captain of the Dragoons in Barbados. Maybe we can see him, said Judith, blowing out the candle and hopping into bed. If he comes up from New London, he'll have to cross the river at Smith's Ferry. I'm going to get a peek at him no matter what Father says. You don't often get a chance to see all those soldiers in uniform. For a good many Weathersfield citizens, curiosity got the better of loyalty on the next afternoon. Kit and Judith met a fair number of farmers and their wives traveling along the South Road and ranging along the bank of the river. They had a good hour's wait ahead of them, lightened by the arrival of an escort from Hartford, led by Captain Samuel Talcott, one of the Weatherfield men Kit noted with surprise, who had occasionally joined the meetings in her uncle's company room. I'd have no part in greeting that Andros, commented one farmer. The crabs would pick my bones before I'd do it. Look at the fine horse all ready for his highness. They should have asked me. I'd have found a horse for him all right. Captain Talcott sensed the growing anger in the waiting crowd and raised his voice. There is to be no demonstration, he reminded them. The governor comes here under orders from his majesty. He will be received with all due courtesy. Presently, a murmur arose as the first red-coated horseman appeared on the opposite shore. There he is, excited voices cried. The tall one just getting off his horse. He's getting into the first boat there. The ferry boats crossed the wide river without mishap, and the party from Boston stepped out onto the shore at Weathersfield. More than 70 men there were, with two trumpeters and a band of grenadiers. Kit thrilled at the sight of the familiar red coats. How tall and handsome and trim they look, beside the homespun blue-coated soldiers. And Andros! He was a true cavalier with his fine embroidered coat, his commanding air, and the wealth of dark curls that flowed over his velvet collar. How elegantly he sat the saddle of his borrowed horse. Why, he was a gentleman, an officer of the king's dragoons, a knight. Who were these common resentful farmers to dispute his royal right? He made their defiance seem childish. Governor Andros had no cause to complain of his reception at Weathersfield. The people kept a respectful silence. The Hartford escort saluted and showed a praiseworthy discipline. As the band rode out of sight along the road, a few fists were shaken, 
and some small boys hurled clumps of mud after the last horse's hooves. For the most part, it was a somber group that straggled back to their neglected chores. The magnificence of Andros and his procession had shaken their confidence. They all knew that this haughty man was on his way to meet with their council, and that before night fell, he would hold their very lives in his hand. Resignation and despair settled over the household that evening, as though, Kit thought, it were the eve of that doomsday that the minister warned of in Sabbath meetings. There was no company to look forward to. William was a member of the militia in Hartford, and John had sent word that he must care for two of Dr. Bulkley's patients while the doctor attended the session. In Matthew's scowling presence, the others scarcely dared whisper. Kit was thankful when she and Judith could escape to the cold sanctuary of the upstairs chamber. They had been fast asleep for some time when they were startled awake by the thudding of hooves on the road below and the whinny of a horse suddenly reined in. There was an echoing rap of a musket against the door. And we're going to pause here and finish this chapter up in the next video. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for listening. I really love you guys. Bye-bye.